In this lecture, we discuss how to compute the total amount of change of a function during a period of time. We'll calculate this using a definite integral, which is defined as a limit of something called a Riemann sum. Imagine that you took a two-hour walk. At the beginning, you were walking slowly at one kilometer per hour. If x of t is your position in kilometers, then at first your position was changing by the rate dx dt equals one. But you didn't stay at that speed. Instead, you accelerated, increasing your speed by three kilometers per hour every hour. Hence, your position was changing at the rate dx dt equals one plus three times t. By the end of the two hour walk, you increased your speed by six kilometers per hour so that you were walking at a rapid clip of seven kilometers per hour. The question we want to answer is, how far did you walk during those two hours? Let's examine a plot of your speed, which we'll call your rate, as a function of time. Here we see how you steadily increased your rate of walking from one kilometer per hour to seven kilometers per hour. To estimate how far you walked, let's do the following. Let's break the two hour walk into two intervals of one hour each. We'll call the length of these intervals delta t, so right now delta t equals one. What makes it hard to figure out the distance is that you continuously changed your velocity. If you had just walked at a constant rate, it would have been much easier. So let's pretend that during each period of length, delta t equals one hour, you didn't change your speed. During the first interval, from hour zero to hour one, let's imagine you kept walking at your initial rate of one kilometer per hour. In this imaginary exercise, we don't have you change speed until the second interval, beginning at hour one. During the second interval, you will again walk at a constant speed, but you'll walk at the constant speed from the beginning of this interval, which in this case is four kilometers per hour. For this calculation, we are approximating the green curve by the two blue horizontal line segments. Calculating the distance traveled in each interval is simple. From hours zero to one, we assumed you walked steadily at one kilometer per hour. Multiplying the rate one by the time interval delta t, which is one, we get a distance of one kilometer for the first interval. The total distance up to this point is one kilometer. From hours one to two, we assume you walk at four kilometers per hour. Multiplying this rate by delta t, which is one, we get a distance of four kilometers for the second interval. The total distance walked during the whole two hour walk is one plus four equals five kilometers. Obviously this is a poor approximation of the distance you walked. You actually walked faster than we assumed. You should get credit for more distance. You argue that it is unfair to use the slow initial rate and that we should instead use the rate at the end of each interval. Fair enough, let's try it that way too. The first method was called a left-handed estimate, as we use the left point in each interval. Let's switch to a right-handed estimate, using the right point in each interval to give the approximate rate during the interval. With the right-handed estimate, we assume that you walked at four kilometers per hour during the first interval, since that was your ending rate at hour one. During the second interval, we use the rate seven kilometers per hour, as that is the rate at which you ended the walk we get a pretty different result. Now we calculated that you walked four kilometers in the first hour and seven kilometers in the second hour for a total of 11 kilometers during the two hour walk. There is quite a difference between the two calculations, five kilometers for the left-handed estimate and 11 kilometers for the right-handed estimate. I think we can agree that assuming your rate was constant during the one hour intervals was too gross of an approximation. To improve accuracy, let's double the number of intervals to four with an interval length, delta t, of one half an hour. If we use a left-handed estimate, we'll still be underestimating your walking distance, but not by as much. We have to do four calculations, using the rates of one, two and a half, four, and five and a half kilometers per hour in each of the four intervals. We multiply those four numbers by delta t, which is now one half, to get the distances walked in those four intervals, one half, one and a quarter, two, and two and three quarters kilometers. Adding up those four numbers, we get the total walking distance of six and a half kilometers. That's an improved estimate, though it is still underestimating the distance. You also insist we try the right-handed estimate, approximating the rates in the four intervals by your final walking speed in each interval, i.e. we should use the rates two and a half, four, five and a half, and seven. Multiplying those numbers by one half and summing them up gives us an estimate of nine and a half kilometers. 
with four intervals, our left-handed estimate of 6.5 kilometers and our right-handed estimate of 9.5 kilometers are closer together, but still not too close. We expect the actual distance you walk to be somewhere in between. Let's refine our estimate further by increasing the number of intervals all the way up to 10, which brings the delta t down to 0 0.2. Now we have 10 different rates, each of which we must multiply by 0 0.2 and then add them up. When we do this for the left-handed estimate, we get 7.4 kilometers for your walking distance. When we repeat the work for the right-handed estimate, we get 8.6 kilometers. It seems clear that as we increase the number of intervals, we get a better estimate of your walking distance. It's time to derive a formula for the calculations we've been doing. Let's decrease the number of intervals back down to four and move everything up a little to give us some space to figure out the formula. Let's begin with a left-handed estimate which we'll call i sub l. The i is supposed to warn you that we are working toward the integral we mentioned at the beginning, and l is for left. The formula for i sub l shows that we took the rates 1, 2 and a half, 4, and 5 and a half, multiplied them by the current delta t of 1 half, and added them up to get the result of 6.5. To write a more general formula, we need some notation. Let f of t be the function that gives your velocity at our t f of t equals 1 plus 3 times t. We also define the time points t0, t1, etc. shown at the bottom of the graph. In this case, they are just multiples of the time interval delta t. For the left-handed estimate, we need to use the rate at the beginning of each time interval. For interval 1, we used t0. For interval 2, we used t1, etc. In general, for interval i, we should use t sub i minus 1. The rate at this time is f of t sub i minus 1. To get the distance traveled in this interval, we multiply the rate by the interval length delta t. We rewrite the formula for i sub l using this notation. The rates at the beginning of each interval are f of t sub 0, f of t sub 1, f of t sub 2, and f of t sub 3. We multiply these by delta t and add them up. If we had 100 intervals, writing this out would take a lot of space. To save space, we'll use summation notation, defined by this capital Greek letter sigma. This summation notation means that we are going to take all the intervals i from 1 to 4, i.e. we will let i be 1, 2, 3, and 4. For each value of i, we calculate f of t sub i minus 1 times delta t. In other words, we calculate the four terms we have above. The first is for i equals 1, which means t sub i minus 1 is t sub 0. The second is for i equals 2, etc. With this summation notation, we can compactly write the left-hand estimate for any number of intervals n. The total distance estimated is the sum, for i equals 1 to n, of f of t sub i minus 1 times delta t. We can repeat all these calculations for the right-handed estimate. The only difference is that for interval i, we now use the right time point, t sub i, and calculate the rate as f of t sub i. When n equals 4, we use the rates f of t sub 1, f of t sub 2, f of t sub 3, and f of t sub 4. The summation notation is exactly the same, except that we use t i rather than t sub i minus 1. Since these sums are so important, we give them a special name, Riemann sums. We have derived two different Riemann sums, the left Riemann sum and the right Riemann sum which is the left endpoint or the right endpoint of each interval to compute the estimate. How large an n should we use to estimate the distance you walked? Is n equal 10 enough? Should we use n equals 50? When n equals 50, the left Riemann sum gives 7.88 kilometers, and the right Riemann sum gives 8.12 kilometers. They are getting quite close to each other. How about n equals 100? It seems our estimates are getting close to the value of 8 kilometers, though even at n equals 100, the Riemann sums are still 0 0.06 kilometers away from that number. I think we shouldn't stop at n equals 100. We should let n get even larger. Why hold back? Why not let n go all the way to infinity? When we let n go all the way to infinity, or, more precisely, we take the limit as n goes to infinity, we arrive at the definite integral. The definite integral, or the Riemann integral, 
is defined as the limit of the Riemann sums as n approaches infinity. The correct answer for the amount that you walked is the integral from 0 to 2 of f of t dt. Notice that this integral can be defined from the left Riemann sum or the right Riemann sum. It doesn't matter which you choose, you'll get the same integral. More precisely, we say the integral exists when both limits arrive at the same number. The definite integral is a single number. Here we expect that the definite integral should be 8, though we won't show that here. For this example, we are integrating from 0 to 2. You walked for a total of 2 hours. The entire interval of integration has length 2, and the length of each subinterval, delta t, is 2 divided by n, as we chopped up those 2 hours into n pieces. In general, we might take the integral of a function over an interval of t from a to b. In this case, the length of the interval is b minus a. So when we chop it up into n subintervals, the length of each of these subintervals, delta t, is b minus a divided by n. To determine the endpoints, t sub i, we have to add the endpoint a. So t sub i is a plus i times delta t. Let's see what this means with an example. Let's estimate the integral from negative 4 to negative 1 of x squared dx using Riemann sums of 6 intervals. Notice I switched letters on you here. We're now using x rather than t, but it is all the same. What is the length of each interval delta x? The lower endpoint a is negative 4. The upper endpoint b is negative 1. The length of each interval delta x must be b minus a divided by 6. Since negative 4 minus negative 1 is 3, you get that, right? Delta x is 3 sixths, or 1 half. To calculate the endpoints x sub i, we start with a equals negative 4 and add multiples of 1 half. We determine that x sub 0 is negative 4, x sub 1 is negative 3.5, etc. We are chopping up the integral into the intervals negative 4 to negative 3 and a half, negative 3 and a half to negative 3, etc. We start with the formula for the left Riemann sum. We need to take the sum from i equals 1 to 6 of f of x sub i minus 1. The function we are integrating is just the squaring function, so we must add up x sub i minus 1 squared, multiplied by delta x. In other words, we take x naught squared, x1 squared, all the way up to x5 squared, and multiply these by delta x before adding. Let's plug in the numbers. Delta x equals 0 0.5, and the values of x naught through x5 are negative 4 through negative 1.5. When we carry out the calculation, a calculator is your friend, we get 24.875. If we redo the calculation for the right Riemann sum, the only difference is that we use x sub i rather than x sub i minus 1, i.e. we use the endpoints x1 through x6. Everything else remains the same. When we add these numbers up, we get 17.375. It's clear our left and right Riemann sums aren't too close together, so we should take more than six intervals to get a better estimate of the definite integral. But the value of the definite integral is probably somewhere between 17 and 25. In summary, we define a definite integral as the limit of a Riemann sum. The definite integral is just a single number. This is in stark contrast to the indefinite integral, which is a function plus a constant. I wonder why, if they are so different, we call them both integrals and use a similar notation for both of them. We'll have to save that question for another time.